few weeks ago a study of man as the Bible presents them, and I will shift that over to this afternoon, and we'll continue then. But I was doing some reading yesterday in a book that belonged to my father. Uh, it just happened to be the closest one, and I pulled it down and, and was reading through it. As I held it up, something fell out of it. And you'll see why I'm doing what I'm doing when I read this to you. Daddy made notes as he taught classes. And this little three by five card on one side has about three scripture references. The other side, he had uh, jotted down, this is back in 1979, uh, about four names. It has deacons outside them. I don't know what that was all about. And uh, actually has something down here. 1967, so I have no idea. But the thing that interests me, and it fell out of this particular commentary I was reading, as to today. Today, of course, we have Father's Day. And it's interesting that he, he must have been studying Galatians where the you come across Abba Father. He sent forth the Spirit of His Son to our heart, crying Abba Father. So he had made these notes in his own handwriting. And I found this interesting being that this is Father's Day. The Bible has so much to say about uh, fathers and the importance of them and their work. But I thought you'd find this interesting and I didn't know Philip was going to leave uh, the song where our Lord said, Abba, Father. Anyway, he wrote down the word Abba and then he wrote out beside it. Slaves were forbidden to address the head of the family by this title. It approximates to a personal name in contrast to father, with which it's always joined in the New Testament. That's interesting. Then he says, Abba is the word framed by the lips of infants and betokens unreasoning, unreason, see, unreasoning trust. Father expresses intelligent apprehension of the relationship. The two together express the love and intelligent confidence of the child. And then he writes down it's an Aramaic word, which is the language spoken in Palestine at that time period. So I thought, well, this is Father's Day today and what falls out of one of Daddy's books other than these notes he was using to teach on and of all things it has to do with an explanation about Abba and the difference in the Aramaic term Abba for Father which equates to our Daddy really. Our Dad, Papa, however you would say it. It's an affectionate term, a term of of a familial relationship and the trust of the child in the father. Um, so you have Abba Father fully explaining what a father is. And that happened after I had determined to do some other things today, this morning. Because as I said, uh, this typology lectureship is so wonderful. It just gives you information that's important for the moment, but it also opens up a great many doors. And our, uh, shall I say, the spring delegation was well represented and speakers in attendance. Uh, Jeff and John did such a great job in their presentations. And uh, Jeff has now got himself on the open forum bracket because he conducted one of the open forums. I won't uh, tell you, Jeff, what I told Michael when he said, do you think Jeff could do good on that? You'll just have to wonder what I said. Anyway, he did well and appreciate his knowledge and practice of the truth. So much, the whole church here, but I don't hope we don't get the big head. We just got a lot of talented people here when it comes to their knowledge and practice of the truth and their ability to speak it. And Eric, you have to watch out because I had a chance in taking a phone call asking about you if you'd be willing to speak on a certain lectureship. Now you'll have to wonder what I told you. So I've got two wonders, maybe. But I thought I would, uh, when I got back, I thought, well, I'm going to look back and build some sermons on the uh, book of Hebrews. 
this is Father's Day. I had that note fall out from Daddy and read it. And then I thought, well, why not look at Jesus pictured in the book of Hebrews? Of course, it ties in typology. But I want to bring a lesson this morning. And there will be at least a couple others. On the better medium that Jesus is. You know, God so loved the world. Our Heavenly Father so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. When you look in John, the Apostle's writing of the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Without Him was not anything made that was made. And then in verse 14, And the Word became flesh, and we beheld His glory. Glory is of the only begotten, of the Father, full of grace and truth. Fathers, if they're what the Bible says a father ought to be, mimics or follows the pattern of their heavenly father. They give the best they can give to their families. Our heavenly father, to save our souls from eternal damnation, gave the best that heaven had, of which there's no greater, to this earth, to become a man, to live as a man. Being tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin. As he said, to this end was I born, in that he knew he must go to the cross and he must suffer, bleed, and die that terrible death and then be raised the third day to die no more and to offer us the great gospel of Jesus Christ, the glad tidings of Christ, whereby that we can be saved from our sins become a part of our Father's family, added by our elder brother Jesus Christ, the builder of the church, to that body when we're baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, Galatians 3.27, Acts 2.38. So I want to emphasize what the writer of Hebrews emphasized in the first part of that letter to these Hebrew Christians. I remind you, as we did when we studied this not many months ago, that these were people who heard the same gospel we all have heard, believed it, and from the heart obeyed it, and they're members of the Lord's family, the church. But they have undergone much persecution. And according to the writer of Hebrews, they had not yet resisted under blood, but they could, and they probably would. And yet to get out from under all this pressure and pain, privation, persecution, they were actually thinking about leaving the New Testament system and going back under the law of Moses. That's hard maybe for us to understand, but we didn't live as they lived then. They had approached God at one time under the law of Moses, for it was God's will for their life. That had changed with the coming of Christ, with his death on the cross, because the law of Moses was nailed to the cross, Colossians 2 and verse 14. And they now, as all men must, approach God through the New Testament or covenant of his son, Jesus Christ. I don't know how they were persuaded to do that. Maybe somebody said, well, if that works so well over here and God accepted you, why won't it still work? Persecution, hurt being brought against you because you do something or you don't do it, can cause you to take a different view of things. It shouldn't, but it does. So anyway, they were in that condition, and so there needed to be, in God's infinite wisdom and the writing of the New Testament of His Son, a letter in here that shows the superiority of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, who our lovely, loving Heavenly Father gave to us to save us from our sins. So if you look at chapter 1, verse 1, down through chapter 4, and verse 13, you'll find the better medium, better than what the law of Moses had, the better medium. And under the better medium, you can find the Christ. He is a better revealer, chapter 1, 1 through chapter 2, 18, in that he is better than, number one, the prophets under the old law, and better even than the angels. He is a better mediator, discussed in chapter 3. Indeed, he's better than Moses. He is the 
better rest provider, chapter 4, 1 through chapter 4, 13. He's better than Joshua. Now I told you that listening all week long to the lessons on typology, then that caused me to think these other areas. Not because it's all new to me, it just simply reviewed what I'd studied before and caused things to come back to mind. So I decided to do this. So I would like for us to look this morning at Christians have the better medium. And that covers fundamentally chapter 1 1 through chapter 4 13. We as members of the Lord's family, Christians, as that term is defined and used in the New Testament, have the Christ, the anointed one, as the better revealer. The fact is that God has spoken. Look in verses 1 and 2. God heard sundry times and divers manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. He has revealed himself to man as a man. He spoke long ago and he's spoken in these last days according to the writing at the time the letter was written. It had been long ago he had been speaking, but... Of course, this is 2,000 years ago to us, but at the time the letter was written, he was speaking in those last days. Long ago, he spoke to men by means of the prophets. There was a good discussion on the word prophet. Many times today it's used to mean predicting the future. That's only a little bit of his work. Prophet comes from a word meaning really what the old gangsters used their lawyer, their mouthpiece. The prophets were the mouthpiece of God. They were foretellers that is forth tellers not foretellers except when foretelling the future figured in to the work they were doing he spoke in various portions according to hebrews 1 1 and 2 and he spoke in many different ways he gave then to fleshly israel the law of moses and he gave it through angels paul references that fact in galatians 3 Verse 19, then Stephen in his declaration in Acts 7, 38 mentions Moses. But then in verse 53, he mentions the angel's place and the giving of the revelation of the law of Moses. But his divine message that is for all men everywhere, now at the time he wrote the letter and till the end of time, has been given through, that is, by means of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, His only begotten Son. And this Son is greater than those angels, and He's greater than all of the prophets. The writer, inspired of the Holy Spirit, writing part of the New Testament of the Christ, in what I consider to be a beautiful and wonderful description in much detail, continues to stress the greatness and the authority, we might say in the power and the position of the deity of Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, our Savior. You see, we get concerned about doctrine because we're concerned about Christ. If we're concerned about doctrine and not concerned about Christ, then we're concerned about the product and not He who produces it. Our faith in Jesus as the Son of God and our Savior is all coming from the words that reveal to us the evidence that He is the Son of God. So His, His greatness implies the greatness and the importance of the message which came through Him. That's magnified in the whole body of truth that is the Bible and especially the New Testament. The writer emphasizes that because of who He is, and what he is, then we had better listen to what he has to say. So we ought, that's imperative, we must give the more earnest heed to the sacred message than was given to the original message of the law of Moses. Now that does not denigrate or put down the law of Moses. It just simply means it was less than is the gospel of Christ. In that what one accomplishes over the other. 
why the law of Moses came from God for the Jewish people and it was preliminary and guided them if they really understood it to the Christ, Galatians 3.24. So we don't mean it's lesser in that sense any more than he when he uses uh, better here. But it simply was never to accomplish what the New Testament was to accomplish. It couldn't accomplish what the gospel system could accomplish. Our very salvation depends upon our giving heed to this wonderful gospel message. Jesus said one time, take heed what you hear. Be sure it's God's Word. And then He said, take heed how you hear it. Make sure you have the disposition of heart you should have in listening to the Word of God talk to you. So we must be careful. We must give earnest heed to the divine message. Lest happily we drift away to other things spoken. So there's so many letters of the New Testament written to Christians to keep them faithful. It's very easy for us to let the affairs of this present world draw us away from the divine message. This obligation is clearly seen in consideration of a previous message. And there was a previous message. The law of Moses. And it too was given by God for a specific purpose. It was delivered, remember, through angels. This was the law of Moses. And this previous message, according to the writer, proved steadfast. It was God's will for the Jews. Now with reference to it, every transgression and every disobedience received its just recompense. That is, received the proper punishment for transgressing it. If the previous message, and this is the reasoning of the inspired writer, remember to whom he's writing, if the previous message demanded punishment, punishment proportionate or commensurate with the transgression, then obviously the greater message would have even more fearful consequences in the event of one's failure to heed it. And we may say, not only the whole body that is the New Testament system, but any component part of it. There shall be no escape, according to the inspired writer, from the fearful consequences for those who neglect the divine message that is spoken through God's Son. I sometimes sit back and watch all the news on television and all of the ungodliness, base activity of people who reject God who reject anything pertaining to God, who deny the deity of Christ and everything pertaining to Christianity. And, you know, you want to get angry. That's your human approach. But when you think about what they face when they die, and especially at the judgment, you cannot help but feel deeply, deeply sorry for such benighted, foolish people that they would anchor themselves in this present world and not look beyond the flesh, and the material of this life. For there looms before them that which their minds cannot begin to understand. I think of the 50 or thereabouts that were killed and others wounded and people in that situation as it was last week in Orlando and how in a moment they stepped into a realm that was foreign to them, that they had never considered, they had no idea of it, and yet... As the rich man was described, he lifted up their eyes in torment because of that flame that is eternal. Some people have a hard time understanding a flame that doesn't go out and that you cannot be burned up or down, whichever way you describe it, like we burn things today. But even in this life, in the Old Testament, we have an example of that. Moses saw a bush that burned and was not consumed. Now, if God can do that in the physical world, what do you think He can do in the eternal for those who die contrary to the gospel, who reject the Son? Well, people just don't know what is just one heartbeat away. The writer, and remember, he didn't write this to those outside the church. He wrote this to people in the church. The writer continues in his letter, to stress the superiority of the Son over angels. He emphasizes that it never was God's plan to subject 
the world to come, that is the age to come, the age following the Mosaic age, to angels. On the other hand, it was God's plan to subject all things to the Son. But at the time of the writing, that is this letter, not all things had as yet been subjected unto him. Now, inspiration has him write what we see now. And this is what he wrote. We behold him who has been made a little lower than the angels, even Jesus. Because then of suffering and death, he's crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Hebrews 2.9. I suggest to you, and we study this for many Wednesday nights regarding the Bible, mental health, or psychology, what you want to call it, one of the things that could help get ourselves up off of ourselves and thinking about ourselves, and Buddy likes to use the word mama always used to me, the mully grubs. Don't get into the mully grub state of mind. We would do well to think about what God did for us we couldn't do for ourselves, what Jesus did for us, and he gave his life for us. Before we all get old, woe is me attitude, just think about what Jesus did for us. It was God's plan that through Jesus Christ of Nazareth, many sons should be brought to glory. And that means me. And that means you. And everybody that will humbly receive with meekness and grafted word, the great gospel, God's power to save us. And you know, we're just so few in the world. No wonder we're instructed and admonished to love one another. Read John writing to the church in 1 John. He'll say, my little children... Love one another. All too often, we kind of like to pick one another to pieces. Yet we sang a song this morning that talks about us bearing with one another, helping each other, understanding none of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. We ought to understand that, how we work with one another. This perfect plan for a perfect salvation necessarily then demanded a perfect Author, The author of this salvation was made perfect through his own sufferings. There's a beauty in this. A beautiful unity and closeness between the saved and the author of their salvation. This should make us stop and contemplate some things. They are brethren. Yes, he's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's our King of kings and Lord of lords. All authority he has that God, his Father, has committed to him. But the Bible also says that we're his brethren. And here's the way it's brought out. In other words, we're all unified because of the gospel. His part in it and our part in it. For which cause he, that's Christ, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Now think about that for a minute. You know what we said about family? And what a father does for his family. And here Jesus has done this for us. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 11. He's not ashamed to be called brethren. So when I acknowledge Christ as the only begotten Son of God and Savior of the world who has all authority and glory and honor and power and majesty be unto Him, He still calls me a brother. Sometimes we're brothering and sistering one another. We ought to think about why we can do that. That's a pretty privileged thing to be able to say brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. It couldn't be without Christ. It couldn't be without His gospel and our belief and obedience to it. And by our obedience to it and being baptized for the remission of sins, being inducted, if you please, into God's great family. This is according, of course, to Old Testament prophecy. Uh, he took upon himself a fleshly nature. He took upon himself a human nature that he might be like those in whose behalf he came and lived and died. Which means that which he created, he became a part of. And something that will boggle your minds. Once that the second person of the Godhead, the great executor of the Father's will, Decided to become a human. Listen to me. He never ceases his humanity. 
when Paul, many years after the ascension of Christ following his resurrection, wrote to Timothy about mediator between God and man, he said there's one mediator between God and man. The man, Jesus Christ. But he prayed, Father, glorify me with the glory I had with thee before the world was. He's glorified humanity. There's only one being like Jesus Christ. God, as much as God can be God, and man, as much as we are. And now he's glorified humanity. A preview of what awaits us. For John declared, we do not know what we should be like, but we shall be like him. No wonder they suffered in the first century unto death, for they saw just beyond the heartbeat. The glory that awaits us. And it awaits all of us today. We'll but be firm and steadfast in our obedience to the truth unto the end. It also tells us how much worth we should place on one another as brothers and sisters in God's family. And the encouragement and work that we should put out for one another. Brethren, I don't love you. No matter how much I may, may say I love you. If I don't teach you the truth. I don't love you and you don't love me. If we don't help each other, always be obedient to what's necessary to be faithful to the Lord. Now what does that say about brethren who slip slide away and we in our piousness go along and let them slip and let them slide? Well, I'm concerned about it. No, you're not. Think about it. If you had your own flesh and blood and they were to do that, would you say you really were concerned and loved them? And just let them slip off back into the wilderness? Saying, good riddance, they don't love us, let them go. You cannot find that disposition of heart among brethren taught in the scriptures. You cannot find that disposition of heart set out by Jesus Christ toward us. In fact, you remember the 90 and 9? The 100 sheep, one goes astray. Now what does the shepherd do? Well, we've got 99 left. He leaves the 99 to look for one sheep. Now there's a lesson in that in your Bible that you can read if you've never heard of me. What lesson do you draw from it? And is it binding on us? Certainly it is. He became like us so we could become like Him. He, therefore, is in position... To help his brethren. It's sort of like this. If we'll let him. <laughs> if we'll let him. Have you ever known what somebody needed and you had the wherewithal to provide it and they wouldn't let you? Now imagine how God feels. We as mere old humans feel that way. When we know we can help. But they won't let us. But he'll help us. He'll guide us. He'll strengthen us. But not without our cooperation. Not without our proper disposition of heart toward him and his word. So it says that he can succor them that are tempted because he's been through what we've been through. There's nothing you can experience in life or in persecution because you're a Christian that he hasn't experienced. He understands. And he got through it perfectly. He never sinned. We oftentimes do. Wherefore it behooved him in all things to be made like unto his brethren that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Chapter 2 and verse 17. Aren't you glad? He's at the right hand of God making propitiation for us that he died to be able to do that. He knows what it means to be a human being. He knows what it means to suffer. Sometimes we sing a song, Jesus knows, Jesus cares. I wonder, do we believe it? He knows what it means to be tempted, solicited to do evil, to break God's will, to sin. Chapter 2, verse 16, Hebrews, For verily not to angels doth he give help, but he gives that help to the seed of Abraham. Now that's interesting. A Jew without knowledge of the New Testament think, well, that's fleshly Israel. Go back and read his letter, Paul's letter, to the Galatian churches and go to a very familiar part in Galatians 3, beginning in verse 24. And then understand what he means in Hebrews 2.16 when he says the seed of Abraham. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us into Christ, 
that we might be justified by faith. But when that faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. For you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as have been baptized into Christ and put on Christ, there is neither, now listen, there is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female. But what? While you're all one in Christ. And if you be Christ. Then you're the seed of Abraham. Heirs according to the promise. You see this typology business comes in. Israel was a type of the church. And at the time the writer of Hebrews wrote this. He makes it clear. That he wants to give help. Christ does. To the seed of Abraham. But who's the seed of Abraham? The church of the living God. Spiritual Israel, that better Israel, based upon better promises, on a better testament, from a much better lawgiver and savior and revealer. The Son is indeed, then, the better revealer, better than prophets and better than angels. He's the better author, the perfect author. Of the better plan. The better message. Furthermore as I've already touched upon. He is the better mediator. He's better than Moses. Now how great Moses was. Moses was a type of the Christ. He's the apostle and high priest of our confession. He was faithful to him. That appointed him. As was Moses. But he. The Christ. The anointed one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Just as the one, he says, who builds a house has more glory than the house. So it is that the Christ has more honor. He has more glory than Moses. Moses was a part, a part of the house. But the Lord is the builder of the house. Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant. But the Christ is faithful over God's house as his only begotten son. The little prepositions can't be overlooked. Moses related then to the type. But the son relates to the antitype. Whose house, the writer says, are we. But it's conditional. If we hold fast our boldness and the glory of our hope firm unto the end. Chapter 3, verse 6. Now those who constitute the house of God over which Jesus Christ is head, first of all, must be diligent to maintain God's favor. Am I diligent to maintain His favor? Number two, must exhort one another day by day. Do I exhort my brethren to be faithful? Do I point out where they're not and what they need to do to change and the choices they make? And they must do that and hold it fast, firm unto the end. Four, they must be characterized by an obedient faith. Now in Judaism, Moses was the mediator. Galatians 3.19 But now this son is the mediator between God and man, as we noted from 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5 a little bit ago. The Christ is the better mediator, far better than Moses. Further, the Christ, the only begotten Son of God, is the better rest provider. All through the years, in laboring to live the Christian life and preach the gospel to bring every thought and subjection to Christ as it's set out in the word of truth. One year by year, going on and on. We sing a song like that, on and on and on, plodding along. You yearn for the great rest that's beyond the sight of man. It's a beautiful and wonderful rest to be had in Christ a preview of which we already get, knowing God that holds our sins not against us. That He's abolished our sins as far as holding us guilty. Knowing that the expectation of heaven is our right. Few have that expectation. 
So we have in the church of the Christ something so special. Not many people have it. And upon the terms of the gospel of the Christ, the scripture says, for we who have believed do enter into that rest. We already have part of it. Not in the ultimate resurrection and glorified and all this whole situation of this age is gone. But look what we have that we should meditate on day and night. And that is the reality out there for us that as we press on, keeping the truth, someday we'll hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Chapter 4, 3. It's certainly true that God, through Joshua, gave Old Testament fleshly Israel a certain kind of rest of this world. But again, the Canaan rest was but a type of the rest to be had in the Christ and of the final eternal rest, the heavenly rest. You know, a long time after Joshua had given them rest, David, King David, was still speaking of a rest to come. He said, There remaineth therefore a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Folks, he wasn't just talking about Israel and the law of Moses. You remember that Peter quotes from David in Acts 2 in the first fully recorded gospel sermon. And you'll find there that much that David said had to do with the coming kingdom of our Lord, the family of God, the church of Christ. David spake of the rest to be had in the Christ and of the heavenly, eternal rest. So clearly, as we bring the lesson to a close, clearly the Son is a better rest provider, even better than Joshua, the Hebrew, Yeshua, for Jesus. All tied up. Do you know, and we pointed this out during the lectures, that when you look at all this types and typology, and all this is a unfolding out of the mind of God, all this that pertains to salvation, that all that was set up by God, all these types he knew were pointing to that which he also knew would be pertaining to the scheme of redemption through the gospel in Christ. So you see, that's why the writer of Hebrews will later on say, they without us are not perfect. For all of those people were types of something to do with the kingdom. And thus God had it all planned out in his mind. Isn't that amazing? That down through the thousands of years he unfolds it as man does what man does. And that involves making a mess of a lot of things. He's still in his infinite wisdom allowing for the free will of man. And all their bad choices and their good choices to bring it all to pass. Now I have the utmost confidence in my God and my father on this father's day of human fathers. To know that you're taking on through to the end. And regardless of how bad it looks in Washington or Moscow or London or Houston or wherever it might be. You can't thwart God's plan. And he can't take you out of the family of God unless you choose to leave. And thus we're held in the great hand of God. And we're admonished. As the song says, hold. As a free moral agent, hold. To God's unchanging hand. Are you a child of the living God? Are you a part of his family? As you think of fathers today among earth, are you really acknowledging your heavenly father who brought the human family into existence and gave the role of the husband to the father? Are you willing to receive with meekness engrafted word and seeing the evidence that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is better than all? And the greatest of the great. That he offers salvation. Thus you should believe in him with all your heart. That he's the son of God. John 8, 24. That is done by receiving and understanding the word. Romans 10, 17. That you'll repent of your sins. Acts 17, 30. Confess your faith in the Christ. Romans 10, 10. And be obedient to him. Complete your obedience by being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. And then live faithful to him in his great family. And you'll always be able to wind your day up or wherever you may be or whatever's going on with the wonderful words that few have really a right. People are concerned about rights. That people don't have this right. We're few that do. Our Father, which art in heaven, 
Hallowed be thy name. If it's a child of God, have you sinned? Have you let these things slip? Humble yourself and come back. Remember the day you obeyed the gospel. Renew that love of God in you. Repent of those sins. Come confessing them. And pray God for forgiveness. And look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and is now set down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He knows your thoughts now. So respond as you need to the gospel and obedience to it while we stand and sing.